to welcome you all who are joining me here physically and those who are joining me virtually to the special update of the month of November. This time we are doing it with Sri Lanka Pilot Endocrinologist, an update on several topics in endocrinology. I'm very grateful for the President and the Council of Sri Lanka Pilot Endocrinologist to join me with the Sri Lanka Pilot Physicians to have this meeting today. Today, my co chair is Dr. Manuel Sachinath Tilaka, former president of Sri Lanka Pilot Endocrinologist and the House of Members of Sri Lanka Pilot Physicians, representing Dr. Dinesh Mahindra, the president of Sri Lanka Pilot Endocrinologist. So, to introduce the first speaker, I would like to invite my presenter for to invite uh, Kamani to talk on hyperglycemia management in diabetes. Are we doing it right? Over to you. Thank you very much. So, thank you very much. Thank you for giving me a good introduction to you for giving me this opportunity to talk to you. So, why should we talk about hyperglycemia? Hyperglycemia is actually the greatest community factor for a good glycemic control. So diabetes is common and so is hyperglycemia. As you know, when we manage our patients, hyperglycemia is associated with a very high level of mortality and prevention of hyperglycemia and prevention of hyperglycemia and treatment. So here in my talk, first of all, I will talk about um, the elevated standard cancer and the definition of hyperglycemia is going to be clear. And then the management of hyperglycemia in terms of settings. And also, then I will talk a bit about hyperglycemia in the world and how to manage it. And then, most importantly, prevention of hyperglycemia. So, with that, we go to the first step, which is the second step, the first step, and the second step. In that case, he was found to be driving by his daughter. He had a bit of long-term diet of hyperglycemia, and he found elevated hyperglycemia and the best insulin to make insulin and to quantify. So, for me, he was talking to hyperglycemia and high dose to the victim. The daughter kept the victim in her body to stay healthy. She was healthy. He said he was pointed. He was very dry. So, what did the daughter do? So, I would like to ask the audience what did you do if it was in this case? What did you tell your place and the day before? Yeah. That's it. So, first, she said she will do the place of hospital, which might be my most recommend because it is a child. We need a chocolate bar. What do you think about that? Chocolate is free, isn't it? So, let's see the other response. We will do three things of sugar, put like with sugar into a teaspoon and put it in the mouth. So there's a risk that this might not be easy for her. And this last option is even too sweet with the sugar we can bring up. So of course, this depends on whether the patient is hunted and we can take it from her. So let's go to some theory talks from here, looking at the state in mind. So hypoglycemia is defined. There are two values. We are creating with it. The American Diabetic Association is a common guideline that we set up to define some sugar responsibility, and then it's guideline to achieve state capacity. So the symptoms of hyperglycemia depends on the severity of hyperglycemia. So obviously the first, if the sugar is between 70 to 64, you get the adrenergic symptoms, adrenergic symptoms, 
like taking on some of the competitions. So, um, so most of our patients can be happy to be in the same time as well. So because we have that communication for the body to realize that there is very little health care and the patient health care. It's a uh, flexible level of the you just need the blood pressure to be changed. If you do this, low cervical sugar level. Because the body needs constant glucose supply. So here you get the symptoms of your skin. Some percent of focal area of the symptoms of your skin. It is a common thing you get in the right state in the body. It's a common thing that you can't eat the soap. And you can keep it up so you don't have to get the sugar. You can just have to speak and you can do so much. So we need to ask Thank you. 
so how do we want to know that we are facing a disease? We want to know it is by preventing the development of the disease early. So there is significant improvement also because of their condition uh, most of the time. So if you prevent the development of the disease early, most of the people can still be able to be actually regain their energy. So how do you prevent? So the last section of the treatment has to be actually not that you have to use a private study, but everything is going to be done. So first we have to see always whether these patients are facing the COVID day. So our patients are not facing the COVID day. So sometimes the patients may be wrong and the timing of entering with the name may not be right. So first we have to assess all these and then educate the patients. The next slide I'm showing, this is a patient who should be fluctuating like this. This is a hydrolyzer. If you see, he has a radiolyzer in the body. So, it is even interesting in the body. So, the insulin should be injected to the heart. And the heart is in the structure. But here, when the heart is in the structure, there is even a contraction of the insulin. So, the next thing is relaxing the glycogen. So, this is something that we can be taught in this slide. And showing you the insulin high from the beginning, we will talk about that. So, the insulin is using a big snack. And then, if the patient is on platinum and urea to reduce the insulin, we can stop the platinum and urea. And in advance, we don't have the luxury of tea, but the artificial timing from the healthy is hard to do in the insulin. So, we can just pass the platinum to the platinum. So the protein group has been very overnight and been given by the Bacham studies to show that until four stars can be given, it is like one flower. And then we can be seen by the sugar in the evening meal to prevent the rapid release of sugar while we get a sustained sugar flow. Then these are basically theoretical, the last two things, giving melanin, which stimulates the beauty bond, glucagon infusion, and then the chemistry is stimulating drugs. So here we think about relaxing the lighting standard. If you, if a person is in the advantage and not in the advantage, you relax the lighting standard. If it's young, you want to check diabetes, you want to have a high speed test. Then, substituting the insulin, adjusting the regime. So one thing you can do is, Substituting the insulin pump. For example, rapid action insulin on the right side of the pump is possible to see. And I will show you the next slide. And you can use the regular bandage. And the long action insulin, the analogs are better than the intermediate action insulin. So this, the next slide shows the type of insulin we have to use. Insulin, when it comes to the disease and action. The rapid action, the short action insulin, and the intermediate action and the long action insulin. So we want to talk about the rapid action insulin compared to the regular insulin. It has a higher peak, and then the action is not long lasting. So you don't do post in the rapid action. The long action insulin don't have a much of a peak. So that because the peak is the action duration time, you can have user transfer and senior. And long as you need to be, if they don't have a short peak, the risk of particularly not to have a short peak is less. So these are the types of injuries that we have, the rapid acting injury, the short acting injury, intermediate injury, when patients they are at the moment, and it was discontinued in 2005, long as you need to be at the moment. So this, I think, is an important slide, and I'll spend some time on it. The peak action. So the peak action is where you tend to get high to the machine. Yes. So when I say the rapid action is really, when you turn out with the mean, then the mean sugar level goes down, the action of the rapid action also goes down. So the peak is only for uh, up to 120 minutes. Short action is really peak for two hours. So that's why we should be a bit careful even in hospitalized patients. When you receive the soluble insulin within two hours, it can cause fatigue. Or they are in the evening, they are sleepy, they are in the evening. Then the important thing about the long acting insulin is that they don't have a peak. So the hyperglycemia is quite low. So the other important thing about changing the insulin regime, we can change the basal bolus instead of the meat. 
So this is the graph it shows that um, when you give NPA from the viewer, so the blue line is the viewer, this is NPA, you have a second view. They are both NPA and soluble in the next together at the time. And these are the times where the patient has the power of hypervalency. So if this happens, it means you can put it in into basal borders, the base of the time would be long as you need to be in the next together at the time. So, let's go into this slide, the lifetime snap. So, lifetime snap should be a banana. It should be a long as we have a high rate that is slowly jump on the step and on the So, here we use this lifetime snap to prevent hyperventilation. So, these are how to commonly we tell our patients to take a glass of milk with our sugar. But you can also, if they say, I don't like milk, you can eat this and you can take a handful of nuts and stuff. These are the other things that we can do. Home start is also having impact in children's hospitals. Uh, in many cases, they talk about home start specifically to prevent overnight hyperglycemia by some diabetes patients. The problem with this is unpalatability. In Sri Lanka, we don't have home start, but we have home flour. So, the reason sometimes they use home flour to make some um, form of but the problem here is the lack of hypertension. So then, here is a very drama from the community, allergy, which can be given, but we have never used these things today. But here is a very, they can be used because they increase the glucagon level. Third interleaving is the stimulant of the thyroid disease. But they all have some effects. So, we believe we have to take an idea that we can use the plasma ketones and plasma ketones. So, the key messages in my talk is how to glide in and to be treated according to their level of consciousness and with rapid testing for the high grades with less fat content. It could be followed by low short carbohydrates and slowly up. We could not use this as a condition for the monthly. And following every sort of hyperglycemia, we should regularly monitor CBS for the next one to two days. If the patient is on the monthly, then we have to give the patient on hyperglycemia and let the patient have to give us the patient. We should not give the next dose to prevent the bound hyperglycemia. Then, patient education is very important. And so, we got by in my talk. Thank you very much for your patient education. Thank you so much for that presentation. It's open for questions now. Undetected diabetes, not for me, anti-diabetes drug, presenting with hypoglycemia. Then you will use the HPAOC that is high. So, it's just a common problem. Yeah, I think I'm also used to the insulin, and that is because of the insulin resistance. So, what they did is the insulin resistance, they just hide insulin levels in their body. So, they get a reactive type of hypoglycemia usually, not a fast in hypoglycemia. Following, basically, a very high glycemic index means only they get hypoglycemia within the next three, two to three hours. So, I have seen a few days. So, this type of patient, we think, in particular, drugs like carbos, we can use. And I'm not sure about your question. Yes. Some people say, undetected diabetes, the patient is being arrested by the patient, they just say, so, please to help with hypoglycemia. Right? And they are not, diabetes is not diagnosed as diabetes, not for any drug. Right? So, when you do the HPAYC, HPAYC is high, that is, they are diabetes. So, what I thought is, because they have diabetes at the beginning of diabetes, they are blood sugar 
ันนี้มันฟลักชูเอตมีตัวไทยเย็นเย็นแต่มีอะไรที่ตัวลงไทยมันตัวตันที่เด็ดเด็ดมันเป็นตัวเป็นตัวเอ่อตัวแดงไทยมันจะลงวันออเวสติสติ้งไทยีอะไรที่เด็ดเด็ดเด็ดเด็ดเด็ดเด็ดเด็ดเด็ดเด็ดเด็ดเด็ดเด็ดเด็ดเด็ดเด็ดเด็ดเด็ดเด็ดเด็ดเด็ดเด็ดเด็ดเด็ดเด็ดเด็ดเด็ดเด็ดเด็ดเด็ดเด็ดเด็ดเด็ดเด็ดเด็ดเด็ดเด็ดเด็ดเด็ดเด็ดเด็ดเด็ดเด็ดเด็ดเด็ดเด็ดเด็ดเด็ดเด็ดเด็ดเด็ดเด็ดเด็ดเด็ดเด็ดเด็ดเด็ดเด็ดเด็ดเด็ดเด็ดเด็ดเด็ดเด็ดเด็ดเด็ดเด็ดเด็ดเด็ดเด็ดเด็ดเด็ดเด็ดเด็ดเด็ดเด็ดเด็ดเด็ดเด็ดเด็ดเด็ดเด็ดเด็ดเด็ดเด็ดเด็ดเด็ดเด็ดเด็ดเด็ดเด็ดเด็ดเด็ดเด็ดเด็ดเด็ดเด็ดเด็ดเด็ดเด็ดเด็ดเด็ดเด็ดเด็ดเด็ดเด็ดเด็ด
where they um, the research they recently published and they said that um, Sri Lanka is a new global hotspot in terms of privacy. So what they found was that Results to the adult prevalence of diabetes is 23 percent. This is all among adults, and pre diabetes is 30 percent. So, total, total disability is 53 percent among adults. That means at least one in two people among the adults in Sri Lanka are either diabetic or pre diabetic. And uh, also, here in Sri Lanka, these are the areas, the darker colored areas are the ones uh, where the uh, highest number of patient populations uh, with this disease are. And also, the advice that I mentioned that uh, the prevalence increase in age, female, urban, more affluent populations in the city. So, um, why is it and, and I think all of us need these patients. It is extremely important that um, when we health education, right? The health education is one of the most important things uh, that all of us can do. So we need to get to the bottom of this and try to bring down the statistics. So what can we do in our own way? So a little bit to um, emphasize as to why, what should be the reason for this kind of statistics. And so this walking is a um, uh, common thing and so we need to we have come across such situations. This is a young girl uh, from Marseilles. She came uh, from the very poor background. Her father was a farmer, and mother was a tea plucker. So they, they exerted, uh, you know, they, they were always working, even if um, even to do the household chores. They had to do a lot of things, uh, um, you know, to cook a meal, go out and um, get the wood, they cut the wood, and you know, all these things. So, uh, and the father also was a farmer, so that's a physical exertion. But, however, they died. They died consistently of heart. Uh, and usually they would, uh, for maybe lunch, have about 45 of, of rice. And you know, the teeth in the mint, right? And so they usually have about three to four teaspoons of food. But um, economic situations change and they have a lot of economic uh, problems. And uh, this girl had to move to the city to work in a household, a few households. Well, uh, her main work was to cook for the family. So she had everything. I mean, she, she had to uh, She didn't obviously go out to cut wood and find wood to you know, um, light the home fire. So uh, she had to yeah, cook her so lots of grinders, blenders, and washing machines to do all the housework. Uh, did she change her diet? No. She still had the same amount of carbs in her uh, day to day life. And of course, there was food in plenty. So the picture was taxing a lot of food. And she was confined to a very small area. So this is very, um, it's a quite a common scenario. So all in all, she gained weight and she was taxing, even though uh, none of her family members had this disease. So we all know. Um, white adipose tissue with excess energy, there is excess accumulation of white adipose tissue, and this can get uh, accumulated in our abdomen. Uh, and white adipose in the 1990s, Mexican was uh, found. And after that, uh, then a whole piece of genetic inflammatory markers were found to be secreted from this white adipose tissue, and all these are causing insulin resistance, high, um, hypertension. Dyslipidemia, fatty liver, and all, all sorts of metabolic adverse consequences. And we, as Southeast Asians, when we compare ourselves to a Caucasian, we have a very limited ability to um, store fat underneath the skin in other areas. If you consider a Caucasian, we have seen that their arms and knees are quite big. We have a substantial layer, probably because they, are, uh, they have to face the cold, hard winter in those countries. But in our country, uh, we have a very limited ability to store fat underneath the skin. So if we have a positive energy balance, we can go and be accumulated as white adipose tissue in the tummy area. That's why when we gain weight, the first place we notice is that our tummy can be positive. So, so how should we change? So obviously, these things are, you know, uh, a person who has been diagnosed with diabetes, the disease does not start at that point. These are all going to prune diseases. And uh, in utero, 
the mother's health and the nutrition, if you show these, all those inflammatory markers I told you uh, in the previous slide, they are in certain ways that they will affect the baby and cause various epigenetic factors and put the baby at risk of developing these metabolic consequences in the future. So from the time the baby comes out, through uh, as he or she walks through life, all these changes are, are going to happen eventually. So therefore, in order to prevent lifestyle changes, have to be okay, have to be emphasized on all cross life. So it's not only your diabetic patient. If you have a patient with diabetes, when you give her a it's extremely important to uh, tell the patient that this is not only for you, but it is also for your children and the next generation. So, moving on to the theory behind this. So, let's talk a little bit about the main nutrients. So, you know, three macronutrients, carbs, proteins, and fats. So, if you translate it to energy, so one gram of carbs is equal to four times energy calories. Protein, again, is the same, but fats, of course, one gram is nine, nine kilocalories. So, this is all the things that you know, I'm sure. So, carbohydrates. Will increase the blood glucose. So, if you categorize, there are five main categories from where we get the carbs. It's mainly grain and food made out of uh, grain, that means flour. Then we get starchy vegetables. So, starchy vegetables means like potato, uh, glucose, the manioka, and so on, and all those um, food items. And sugary food. Foods also have it knows a factor which is adding converted to glucose and dairy products. So dairy products milk, uh, ice cream, yogurt, they will have carbs as in the form of lactose, uh, which will then break down in the body to uh, release glucose. Uh, out of the dairy products, curds will not have carbs, it is mainly uh, fat and food. So when we go to proteins, now, proteins will not have an effect on the uh, increase in the blood glucose, but however, excess weight of it will increase the weight of the insulin. So, proteins, you know, it's um, uh, skin, eggs, um, so on. And also, hidden carbs. You know, um, a lot of patients sometimes don't know about this, but uh, dal, um, then green gram, you know, um, chickpeas, beef, also these many things. People think that they have proteins, they do have proteins, but definitely they do also have carbohydrates. Lipids, so lipids um, do not affect blood glucose, but of course, of course, we need to weight gain. So there are healthy uh, lipids, which come in the form of um, uh, oily fish, and then avocado, nuts, and um, oil such as olive oil. Then you also get them. Uh, bad lipids, which are the plants that you can see with deep fried food. Coconut oil is a little controversial, however, what is usually recommended is um, one uh, medium sized coconut for a family of five people for a day. So these food items such as green beans, little vegetables, uh, and tea, coffee without any other milk or sugar, spices, they, they do not. Uh, lead to an increase in the blood glucose. So, what is usually what we advise our patients is for the calorie distribution, mainly three main meals uh, breakfast, lunch, and dinner. And if they do food in the snack, they can have a small snack in this case. So, let's move on to finding out what is carb counting. So, carb counting means estimating the amount of carbs in food and solutions. Simple as that. Okay, so this is uh, mainly um, in the in, you know in the world, it is mainly very essential for patients with type one diabetes. Well, we help them to count carbs and adjust the insulin before they are new. That's the primary insulin according to the amount of carbs that they take. So carb counting is actually mainly uh, used in for type one diabetes patients. But nevertheless, it also has a lot of value for patients with type 2 diabetes who are on six dose regimes, be it oral hypoglycemic or be it insulin. It will help them to have the same amount of carbs to maintain a good post, especially the post prandial peak, uh, and also to control weight. So, how do we count carbohydrates? So there are two main methods. You can 
counted by grants, the carbohydrates, the amount of carbohydrates, and the methylene grants. But you, of course, need carb counting in social studies. Because I'm not sure going to get this data. So it can come in the form of books and And the other method is we can also use exchange. So exchange, one exchange is um, amounting to 15 grams of carbohydrates. And you also have an exchange list which can be used. So this is the book that uh, Lisa and Dr. Marissa was talking about, uh, which was published from the Silver College of Industrial Logic. Uh, this is for, uh, this can be used for carbohydrate collection of Mangalaga. There are several other local uh, other resources to this over here. Um, the Peter Cook, um, uh, uh, write the book, the Peter Cook and the Kenmark is used in this country. Uh, we started the younger population. And then there are various other options also. Um, it can be found online. Um, again, Indian food. And then um, um, in the UK, there, this is a very commonly used book uh, for carbs and calorie count. And there are apps as well. If there's any food item that you want, it gives the carbs uh, and the calories. Well, obviously, you just have to Google it, and there are various um, sources that need to connect uh, my fitness channel. Some of the um, online sources that you can use to uh, find out the more of carbs. So, let's um, look at how this is done using the resource, um, uh, other uh, those resources, which were published from the college. So now here, um, it's, uh, it's this shows a uh, one, one cup of fresh rice. Okay? This is a uh, commonly used tea cup uh, which is uh, usually found in all uh, households in Sri Lanka. So that in a plate would look like this. Right? So one quarter of the um, plate. And this um, here, this will have 30 grams of salt. The weight of this food would amount to 160 grams. The food of the, uh, sorry, the weight of the uh, Amount of one cup of rice. So here um, we've shown you uh, one slice of bread, uh, one sandwich bread, and again now this will have about 15 grams of carbs. And here, uh, if this is the normal ordinary uh, or cutting or less, this is commonly used, right? Quarter, uh, quarter of a uh, loaf of bread, right? Um, and this would amount to 55 grams of carbs. So the weight is about 5 and 12. Yeah. So these are two hoppers. So uh, four more two hoppers, which are usually six, is about, um, you know, here we are, we show four two hoppers, six, four six two hoppers, we have 33 grams of carbs. Whereas um, uh, the two ones, which are usually found uh, when, you, when you purchase two hoppers from outside, uh, it's very clean. Right, um, if you hold it up, you can even see the sky, which is like this. Okay, so those are two string hoppers. So eight of two string hoppers in the amount is the same as four six homemade string hoppers. Same amount of carbs. So roughly the same quantity as one cup of rice. Then um, parachas. Again, uh, this is um, uh, the diary takes about um, 15 cents. So each can be also six cents. Uh, each is like you know, one photo of a finger. Right? So the six cents would be somewhere around here. So obviously, uh, it may depend on the height. But these are all very rough estimations, uh, which we need to um, have to teach, uh, teach patients to do this in a practical manner. This would have about 52 grams of fat. A chapati, this size, would have about 22 grams of tea. Again, the hidden carbs. A lot of people think this that um, patients say that dal does not have carbs, but three tablespoons of carbs, which will amount to 15 grams of carbs, which is the same as half a cup of rice. And um, green gram, uh, one cup. Uh, we use the cup because it's easy to tell patients, uh, otherwise, we'll be commenting us about the spoon, the whole cup of spoon, which obviously is uh, size we do. Uh, very you know, uh, large manner. So, a cup is the easiest way. So, one cup of green uh, land with the bar, we get all 22 grams of tea. Uh, then, town, town is the way to change the size of cup, which is the same as one cup of uh, rice. Cookies is about uh, so three grams of tea. So, again, bananas, um, 
to hear this story, um, Kimiki Hill, same amount, uh, and also Abu's Hill, the same, the way it is considered the way it is the same, and this way it is listed without the key. Right, uh, so without the key, the edible portion. So if you see, Kimiki Hill is about 14 grams of carbs, whereas uh, Abu's Hill is about 7 grams of carbs. So we need to promote that for our scientific the quality of the sauces is as same as the sauces. Papa, again, the sizes are mentioned. So roughly this amount of size of a papa would be about 7 grams of carbs. Avocado is a good taste food for especially people with diabetes because it does not have carbs. It's just minimal, 2 grams of carbs. It has mainly fat. Of course, if you consider uh, someone who wants to eat food, that might be a problem, but uh, in terms of carbs, it has very good. Chocolate cake um, has uh, um, 46 grams of carbs, and um, this is, uh, of course, these are different um, sales depending on the ingredients, how much I'm seeing, and all those things, but these are, of course, very uh, rough distributions. Milk, again, uh, um, 200 ml of um, liquid milk, we have about 10 grams of carbs, which is without any additional sugar. The so milk has lactose. Then we saw um, uh, milk powder. So, 3 teaspoons of milk powder dissolved in water, we uh, have 10 grams of carbs. Date, you can see 4 days, about 15 grams of carbs, and the peanut. Uh, 50 grams, you have only 4 grams of carbs, but uh, bear in mind the excess amount of calories because this will do it. does not have carbs, it has a lot of fat. Um, again, yeah, so this is pretty much uh, 3 inch by 3 inch cheese, about 45 grams, and a hopper would uh, be about um, 13 grams. Yes, this one hopper will be equivalent to about half a cup of rice. So we also, in the book, uh, we also talk about, um, we have um, shown this table on uh, the carbs and health of various foods. Um, yeah, so, uh, tea and coffee without any additional milk or uh, sugar, we do not have any carbs. So how do we count a carb? How do we do this to an entire meal? So say, if uh, you are going to have a meal, um, in the proper way, you just have one cup of milk, right? So that will be about 30 grams of carbs. Um, and with that, three tablespoons of flour. So that is, there are 15 grams of carbs. So, mokuni uh, and an three tablespoons, no carbs. And then, patola, three tablespoons, that again, I told you, green leaves and vegetables, no carbs. And a few pieces of chicken, so that is protein and no carbs. And you, after having your meal, you're going to have one amul bagel, so that's about seven grams of carbs. So, all in all, that entire meal we have about 52 grams of carbs. So, this is what carb counting means, calculating the amount of carbs in your meal. So, we also give patients to read food labels. So here, yeah, if you have, I mean, these are um, usually found in any um, uh, food item. So here, this is a uh, cream cracker um, box, um, packets. And so here, we need to look at the serving size. The serving size, what they mention is 27 grams, which is equivalent to 3 liters. So we have to look at the total carbohydrate, not only the sugars, but the total carbohydrate. And if you see here, the total carbohydrate is given in average, uh, the uh, average quantity per serving and average quantity per 100 grams. So uh, people do not really need to do so. Obviously, we need to go to go by the serving. So three districts will have a total carb amount of 19 grams. So this is the same as bran crackers. People think that um, uh, bran crackers is uh, okay for diabetes. It does not have sugar, but it's more or less the same. So that was uh, we went through how to count carbs using um, bran. So the other way is using an exchange table. So what is a carb exchange? So carb exchange is one exchange is the amount of food containing 15 grams of carbs. So if we uh, look at these, so 
I take one cup to take care of the turkey grain that cup, so half a cup will be 50 or one exchange. It's the same as uh, one sandwich with like so all these food items here will have the same amount of carbs. So one hopper uh, is the same as three tablespoons of dal, and if you look at the fruit, uh, one medium mango will also have the same as half a cup of rice. So, uh, as, yeah, and brown pepper, three brown pepper, we have 50 grams of carbs. So these are, this is what is known as an exchange table. So let's see um, now. In a normal person, if we eat a lot, the, the rise in the blood glucose is going to be higher, and uh, it is going to have a bigger workload for the pancreas. Say, for example, you are going to continue having one cup of rice, it will increase the blood glucose, and the pancreas will have to obviously produce insulin to uh, control it. But if you eat two cups of rice, the rice in the blood glucose is going to be higher and more workload. But if you eat like an entire huge dinner, it's going to be very high. And um, obviously, a normal person will say that um, pancreas is going to work and normalize the blood glucose. But what, when, in a, when, when in a patient with diabetes, what happens? So, in type 1 diabetes, we need to match the insulin to carbs. So this is one five step. So we see patients to count the carbohydrates so using a carb um, using a resource. And again, they need to calculate the insulin to carbs. So this is also patients are saying how much insulin can be. I'm talking about trending insulin. This can only be done for patients who are on base level bonus insulin regimen in some form. So that means these patients will be on a base uh, uh, insulin and uh, pandemic insulin for each meal. So they will have to, before they, uh, before they have their meal, they have to eat at the food, count the carbs, and then uh, they have to, um, they, they should be knowing the insulin carb ratio. That means how much of insulin or sort of insulin they are going to give for the carbs. So usually it's one to ten. That's, uh, that's just a very basic um, uh, definition. And right? so for that 10 grams of carbs, they will give about one unit of soluble insulin. Right? But these will change, the ratio will change. So after that, they, they, so they calculate this amount, then they need to check their blood sugar. And if the blood sugars are not in the target, then you have to uh, calculate the correction dose, and then they need to um, insert. I think in the consideration, there are three prior sugars. So, this is the process that we teach our patients with type 1 diabetes. And uh, so, it's obviously, to do that, we need a lot of resources because patients are supposed to check their sugar, prior sugars, three times a day before the meal. They obviously have to check the sugars and if they need to use it uh, about three times for each meal. Uh, so um, however, this is now possible because um, of the thanks to Australian non-government organization for the life for child, and through them we are able to provide all these resources to about 30 in the front units around the country. And this is coordinated by the SFC team of the Shimata College of in the training of So now when it comes to type 2 diabetes, because that's the bigger problem and that is the reason for all the horrible statistics that I told you before. So what do we do now? Imagine Mr. X has type 2 diabetes, so uh, he's on metformin 1 gram twice daily, which is at least 300 mg caffeine, and three minutes insulin can be used twice daily. So imagine now to the, uh, uh, on day round at night time, this is the amount of food he's going to eat. So he will be uh, take his medication and take this amount of rice, and with that, his blood glucose level will be okay. But on day two, he's going to eat two cups of rice, so then with the same amount of medication, his blood glucose is obviously going to go up. And on day three, he's going to eat this amount, obviously, and you will understand that it's very difficult to uh, check the blood glucose, I mean, to keep the blood whole standard blood glucose intact. So what we can do for this patient is to have a stable amount of carbs during meal time, and this will minimize the glucose fluctuations and help achieve a better glycemic control. So how can we do uh, to achieve this? 
So we can do this by cost counting to achieve a system or such cost. And we can even do six changes, uh, as I mentioned before, or the simple thing is the plate model. So if the previous method is too difficult, but we usually commonly tell our patients is to have for the plate of cost. So uh, these are some of the options. So instead of having a huge plate of rice, it's not the cost, with a for a plate of cost. So um, how do we achieve this by using uh, the previous cost counting method? So here I've shown an uh, example. So the same patient, same Mr. X, uh, he's having type 2 diabetes on drugs. If this is the amount on, on day one, he's going to, for dinner, he's going to have one cup of rice, which amounts to 30 grams of carbs. If you consider this in expenses, it is too expensive. With that, he is making meals and goods and fish. There's no cost. The total is 30 cost or two expenses. So on day two, he's going to switch. He's going to eat something first. So he's going to eat bread. He can have two slices of sandwich bread. Uh, and the sandwich bread slices, right? So the quantity should be two. So that he will also have 30 cost and amount into two exchanges. He can do anything else with the bread and the protein. So he's going to have six and a salad and egg. So total cost is 30. But and uh, two exchanges. So on day three, he's going to have protein. So he's going to have a small dishes, uh, which will amount to 30 cards, two exchanges, and the rest he can weigh. So um, say on day five, he's just two and two six. Uh, so he's going to have just the um, biscuit and one cup of uh, one glass of milk. So that again will amount to 30 cards. And day five, he's just going to eat some fruit. So one large Anamali banana will amount to 30 grams of cup. So this is, this is a way we can teach patients to kind of um, eat what they want, but still have the same amount of cup. Some snacks I think commonly also mentioned. So for diabetes, we say um, just go for low carb snacks. So these, uh, these are some of the options. I said to um, have a cargo, eggs, and you know, salad. The, uh, the guava and uh, salad sticks. These are some of the things which you can uh, you know, get away without um, if you increase in the blood glucose. So this is some mainly for our patients with type 1 diabetes who are on this basal bonus for to achieve good glycemic control. A little bit about um, glycemic index. So the glycemic index, as you know, is the ability of a food to increase the blood glucose artery. So high glycemic index food uh, food, food, uh, food juices, the soft drinks, and uh, food like white bread, whereas low glycemic index food are uh, in the plate model. So, uh, it's a mixed meal will uh, reduce the glycemic index and also uh, food. So, it's always better to go for a uh, fresh food style food juice. Food juice is good in, uh, as commonly mentioned, um, in uh, cases such as taking hypoglycemia, where you want the to go to pick up fire. Uh, last two slides, so maintaining in a healthy day. So this is obviously what we know. So food drinking and energy expenditure has to be changed to, um, to ensure that you don't drink it food before you eat. So one cup, uh, one slice of this cake, it amounts to 36 grams of carbs. You can see the calories here, 238 to burn it off. You have to uh, run if you are running uh, for 25 minutes or walk for 50 minutes. So, a word of calories. <coughs> so, roughly for men and women, this is the, uh, for weight maintenance, this is the rough amount of calories they are allowed to take. But if you want to lose weight, you need to lose about 5 to 10% percent of body weight over the three to six months, and you need to maintain that. So to do that, you have to either reduce your calorie intake by 500 kilocalories or increase the step count or be more uh, particular. It says more, so at least that means about 10,000 steps per day. So finally, the thing for me, diet plays a key role in diabetes management. Know your heart. Um, eating a constant amount of carbs during mealtimes will help to reduce blood glucose and fluctuations in patients on fixed dose regimes. 
and this can be achieved by hard counting or the exchange method or in a simple, more simpler form, a variance to the plate method. Maintaining a healthy weight and shape of the body is important. Thank you. Open for questions from audience. I think a very interesting uh, uh, new sort of approach to manage diabetes at the moment in a very effective way. Maori, uh, I believe, has to not slow the car. Uh, if you notice that some of the cars is not going car fast, but if you notice the calories, the front height has been being uh, by your order. So you have to be careful because the past is one thing for the insulin dose. So how do you now you have to be conscious in time to do that uh, about the total calorie intake, no? So can you comment on your Imbalance, which are muscles in any patient and comfort in the 
differentiate between the forces of type and extreme. But the most important thing is the timing of the system. It has like this low volume state because causal G depends on according to the volume state of the body that is in hyper volume, new volume, low hyper volume. Thank you, Janet. I believe you again. I'm saying the same thing because it's very important. So the history of time to time, we go through the dark phase and see that the uh, graph which goes on for the same graph. Find out whether it is hypothetical or hypothetical. If possible, we are doing not going to exclude hypothetical or hypothetical. More than 100 is going to be the volume failure based on that and the volume failure that we can differentiate between the forces. So, in hypovolume cases, if we do the sodium less than 30, that is, it's just in the plus, like diarrhea, vomiting. If it is more than 30, that is a renal loss, we need the diet. If the patient is in volume, then usually the urine solid is more than 30 minutes, so we will be at hypothyroidism, hypothyroidism, and insufficiency. And in hypovolume cases, if the heart failure period is not particularly long, because of the aldosterone on the immune system activation, we need to be more than 30 less than 30. So, this will be important in your daily questions. You have to try to work out how to do it. Right. So, the easier idea, as I said, you can try to find it from the volume status, hypervolume, involume, hypervolume. Involume is a very easy to remember, as I will do. Hypothyroidism and hypothyroidism, all these are forces of estrogenous. It can be diseases of lung lungs, uh, CMS, mainly, uh, light lungsing, and drugs. So, this, this is a uh, uh, very uh, extensive list of drugs, which can cause estrogenous, estrogenous, and even many more other drugs can cause estrogenous. The main drugs to remember are antiepileptic, antidepressants, and cardiac medications. Okay, so how are we going to manage hypoestrogenic consumption? First thing is first that is to confirm hypoestrogenic, confirm hypoestrogenic, hypoestrogenic, and then do the basic assessment, initial assessment. Look at the sodium level, see the drug symptoms, the basic symptoms are coming, and think of the ETLIP, and based on that, start the treatment and always keep in mind the risk of osmotic demyelination changes. Okay, so let's add the kind of basis for the hyperactivity. So let's uh, discuss three cases and see how we are going to manage these patients. Since an elderly gentleman who, present, who has multiple comorbidities, a smoker, now presented with possible pneumonia, uh, and he was found to have hypoglycemia, so he was found to have a mind that means by simply severe hypoglycemia, he has had vomiting, confusion, sleepiness, and he was just eight. So, what do you think? Do you see how this is a very, very severe hypoglycemia, moderately severe, moderately severe? He is having symptomatic very severe hypoglycemia. So it is so we repeated the surgery, it was again 107, serum osmolar to 145, that means two hypoglycemia, biochemically severe, symptomatically severe, chronicity, we don't know, we let's take it as chronic, so this is the this is severe hyponectemia, what is it? And we just based from the cause. Do urine osmolarity, urine sodium, differentiate the cause. Is the cause fatality or not? So, this is the emergency. So, you have to explicate what you are going to use to correct. If 3% saline, you can use 2% saline and correct. But if you have anything, it might be very kind of. Two and two can fit to overcorrect, but you have to go slow. Right? So, but before starting treatment, in the initial step, assessment again, 
skin doctor ko because after correct acting on the medical emergency then it is cause specific treatment if you, if you haven't think of the cause now you are lost because patient is the volume is taken up so in sodium so then it change you don't know anything so you can't think of the cause so at the very beginning think of the cause of the
Hindi ko na niya going to be too excited. If the Indian sodium urine of the mouth is very high, then the reason is not going to respond to the solid sugar health restrictions. And can you use this formula to calculate the ratio of the other the ratio to the restriction in the number of patients? If it's less than 0.5, even less, we have to go for the restriction less than 1 meter, not to restrict the restriction in the number of patients. Second line therapy is with diabetic soils, urea, vaccines, so two words about vaccines, vaccines, and I'm set up some people in the case of anything to protect the regime, but there's a lot of men who are not collecting that. So you must know that this is a lot of people that can be commonly used for vaccines, so you can use your vaccine power to try to Call that time with the short and very good efficacy. And the short time has an extreme correction. We usually use 15 milligrams the usual dose, but we can even start to spend on time. We try to enter in the middle and the very beginning. So, in summary, it is acute severe symptomatic acute or severe symptomatic hypoglycemia, think it as an emergency, and then look for the cause. We go for cause of this treatment, if it is hypovolemic, we can heal the teeth, and if it is involemic, we can heal the teeth resting, and if it is hypovolemic, we can heal the teeth resting, and if it is hypovolemic, we can heal the teeth resting, and that time can be used in involemic and hypovolemic cases. But avoid over-correction. And sodium correction, why we ask you to keep the target of pain, for 24 hours, otherwise it can cause osmotic demyelination. So there are patients who are at risk, high risk of overcorrection and osmotic demyelination. If you start with it, it is very severe hypokalemia, malignation, and alcohol liberation. All these patients are at risk of ODS. So prevention of ODS is really important. So careful monitoring, careful treatment, and also if it goes wrong, Call the experts with expert opinion. There are ways to reverse overcorrection in this way. I'm not going to explain that. And a few words about the chronic hyponectremia. As I said, there are patients living in the community. Okay, so I'll take on the test. Always explain drug induced hyponectremia. And we also have a patient. To establish the diagnosis and try to prepare the young students and the children for the young to find the cause and management. If you have an insulin, you will have to use the symptoms and see what best fits the problem. Thank you. Thank you, Chandigarh. You just picked the question time because of the subtitle. So we have the last picture to do. Yeah, so. I think you can catch Sandhika after the lecture during lunchtime. It's a very complicated topic. She, you know, covers a vast area. I'm sure you have questions, but we catch her during lunchtime to clarify. And let me invite Dr. Sukhun Vijayavadana, MBBS, MD, and MRCP. He's the consultant endocrinologist at the District General Hospital, Gampaha. Sukhun graduated from the Sri Dhabanpura. University with first class honors and completed his MD in medicine in 2021 and is one of the rising stars in our field. And his research in interest includes calcium and metabolism, calcium metabolism, osteoporosis, primary adult condition, obesity, and bariatric surgery. But today we'll be talking about thyroid function. So we have this interesting, it's a case based. But we went that thyroid down way beyond the ordinary, beyond the ordinary, unusual test in making kidney hormone layers in simply confusing thyroid function test. I think it's over to you. Thank you very much for the introduction. And I would like to thank the Kiran College of Physicians for giving me this opportunity to discuss about the thyroid cases with regard to the thyroid function. So let's directly move to the cases. I am discussing four cases today. So some of the cases probably are familiar, some are not. 
for the first one, uh, in fact, a person, six-year-old lady, admitted with heart failure, took intestinal accommodation, and when they see at the admission, she developed all that level of consciousness. But the hemodynamic was stable, but the county has pulsed around 64 bits low size, but blood pressure was pretty normal, no greater on examination. So, the investigation suggested that he's having mutually leukocytosis or some kind of infection with the elevated inflammatory marker. Sodium was bit low size, which is 132, and potassium normal, and the extreme was arranged because he had some uh, high inflammatory marker, so we made it a year pass, and the suspect said he didn't show any change. Uh, the interesting is the previous case is uh, 4.9, the upper margin was 4. So there's a mild elevated previous case with 3 to 4 words significantly below the lower upper. So there is a discordance we have noted. So can this be due to non thyroid illness? Uh, any idea from the audience? There are not as many a cases they can answer. No. So, you can see in this graph, there are the non thyroid illness, depending on the severity of the illness, the thyroid functions also. So, the main thing in CK uh, thyroid or non thyroid illness, they will have the previous P3 would be increased because of the P3 is converted to a P3 to reduce the metabolism of the body. So, the initially P3 reduces, but later on, depending on the severity, the previous state and sometimes P4 also reduces. So, in this patient, we know that the previous was marked mildly elevated. This could be due to the age related changes. Sometimes the aging can increase the PSH, but on top of the severe illness also. So, we begin to the history again. The most important with regard to thyroid function test interpretation, always go to the history and the examination. So you have to uh, the test whether the patient is having that kind of thyroid state uh, clinically also. So the history, uh, clinically she mentions she had cases of hypothyroidism with weight gain and some poor concentration over past six months in the So what could be the possibility and what are the additional images, uh, actually the, uh, the questions you should ask from the patient if you get the that kind of a patient in your clinic or work with us. So, because running, the time is running, so I will go with the, uh, the history. But, uh, when we begin with the history, the patient told in uh, early thirties we had Postpartum uh, hemorrhage during a childbirth and a lactation failure. So now you are clear what is the diagnosis. So, because of the important thyroid functions and the background history, we go on for a further evaluation with antiretic hormone assessment, serum production, estrogen, cortisol, as shown, low values, and we have confirmed it with the in action test, so I would not discuss in those kinds of tests in detail because it is not the forum to discuss that part. So, the ultimate diagnosis was the patient had anterior hypothyroidism with central hypothyroidism uh, with inappropriately elevated PSH. So, we will discuss what is inappropriately elevated PSH with the secondary abdominal insufficiency. So you can see this graph, there is a use of the PSH and CT, so there is a uh, lovely, negative log linear relationship. So if the uh, P4 is very low, PSH should be significantly elevated. But in our case, the P4 was significantly low at 0.5, the low limit was 0.7. So the PSH should be more than 4.9. So that is the case message. So if you detect a discordant PSH with the CT4, so even normal PSH, so marginally elevated PSH is very low P4, you have to suspect always the central hypothyroidism. And it is very important 
even though PS6 is not there, first it can be because of the rheumatoid factor you have high PS6 value. But this is not the always in the case. Sometimes the rheumatoid factor and some other toxified antibodies, the, the antibodies which are inside our body because of the environmental changes, is applied. So they can bind to the toxified antibody alone and inhibit binding of PS6. And it will not bind to the reduction antibody. So, neither PSH or uh, antibody must bind to the reduction antibody. So, false it will show low value. So, false low or negative interference you can keep it. So, in that instance, we have to get all the support from our colleagues, clinical pathologists. So, they will arrange several serial investigations. Sometimes uh, different approaches, even though we use, may not give the same this kind of uh, that means different value. So in that case, serial sample dilution or polyethylene glycol also used to precipitate the uh, antibodies. So when the supernatural can be put again, so that there is any recovery of polyethylene value. So. But ultimately, once the actual interference confirmed, the neurotoxin dose reduced to his original dose of 125 and patient's hypothyroid features result. So, the next case, the case 3, we have the 29 year old male uh, with non specific symptoms uh, with persistently elevated CSH, and clinically, the patient had three thyroid status. And we have done the investigation and a full one initially for PSH of more than 100. So we don't know that thoroughly. And the 34 was the normal range. So we repeat a bit. It's from another platform. Again, the same result appears. So uh, again, the serial dilution we have arranged. And, uh, Started him on levothyroxine 50 because this is the picture of him. But now PSS is normal, so it is a subclinical hypothyroidism, but the PSS value is not falling with subclinical hypothyroidism anyway. This is also from the local clinic. They have started the levothyroxine, initially low dose, ultimately increased to 150, and with that, they get the clinical presentation of. Hypothyroid people with PSH of 5.6, with PT for 2.6, which is about the academic of normal. So, what is the possibility in this case of this thing? Could this be due to, yeah, the answer is very clear. The next copy of this. Uh, there is a condition called macropiosis. The piosis molecules are bound by uh, the water immunoglobulin by the piosis molecules together and form very large molecules. So they can, they do not cause the uh, circulation. So they, will, they are fully inactive. They do not cause any symptoms. So that's why the patient was infrared at this stage. But the problem was it was detected by the so, the confirmation of macrophage was arranged. So, there are several methods that needed a clear level. The joint filtration chromatography, the stage precipitation, also can be used to remove this large molecule from the sequence of the determinant for the PSH. So, the, uh, the, in, our, in the study, we found that the mercury PSH was around 150 kilo, uh, kilo dolphin, very large, the normal 124 kilo dolphin. Okay. So, mercury PSH, the other things we have discussed. Uh, but with the liver thyroxine, but, uh, the one thing you notice know, is how the effect of the PSH was reduced because the PSH uh, production from the pituitary was significantly reduced. 
and we can have that to your sector. You find it to your sector, low value, but the input data direction doesn't develop toxic filter. That's the clinical presentation. If that kind of a person attempts, we have to always think possibility of an expertise, which is a very rare condition, but can appear in the first place. The last two of the day for 43 year old patients, not that we have tremor and an examination, patient was hepatitis, had time tremor and a disease writer and didn't have any outcomes. So, we have done the thyroid function test. So, from two of those, again, initially because it was discarding. And the SA1, CSH was between the normal limit with the high CT4. So, if the thyroid FCC is functioning, CSH should be lowered. The, again, the second case, we have done similarly. You, have, you can see that. So, high CSH or so high normal CSH is high CT4. So, what's the other possibility? So, with the third assessment, uh, with this thyroid function, we have asked the history. The patient has on and off headaches. Visual T is uh, normal, but he had, uh, he had persistent symptoms. And the family history is given a significant family history of motherhood, thyroid oxytocin, and thyroid extent was done during her uh, long age. And because of this, uh, this current thyroid function, we contacted the clinical pathologist whether there is any interference in possibility to be more common than other courses. So, the interference studies we have done several and found to have no interference. So, what could be the diagnosis at this point? So, interference is excluded, no drugs or anything. Could this be a TSH trauma? So, there are things. It's a micro or most of the time micro adenoma producing TSH, which can produce this kind of clinical presentation. So, if we continue, we have done the PPT protocol, we didn't show any micro adenoma or any changes. So, ultimately, because now we also have similar kind of presentation, we did the genetics. Uh, and the patient found to have uh, resistant to thyroid hormone beta. So, not common then, as uh, so there are two types. So, this is how you differentiate your sex hormone versus resistant to thyroid hormone. Clinically, both the patients can have similar appearance. They can have toxic features. But the family history usually not there in your sex hormone unless there is a uh, some kind of a genetic cause is very, very rare, but uh, and other biochemical steps which could help to narrow down is uh, we can check the alpha subunit of the TSH uh, or TSH. Uh, alpha subunits are predominantly produced with TSH coma compared to the resistance. As well as the ratio, we can check the TSH to alpha subunit to TSH ratio. It is usually more than one in TSH HOMA compared to the persistence. And PRS is not available for us. So if the PRS is available, we can check whether there is PRS response, whether it's blunted or normal. So if there is a tumor producing TSH, it will not step on to outside uh, parameters, so outside clinical side TSH. So it could be blunted in TSH HOMA. Thank you. 
binding of the two sets of the cathode that two pole will be produced with the separating gas and uh, increase of photo sheet. So they will bind to the PDC uh, and uh, it will displace the two sets. And again, uh, biofilm, very important. Most of the time now uh, we are using so cosmetics, treatment, as well as for a fantastic period of population, also they are using for some metabolic diseases. So, biofilm is what they think it's just not the dietary biofilm amount. It can cause a clinical presentation. The biochemical presentation is similar to primary hyperthyroidism. Low TSH with high CT here. You can do it, but uh, when you go home, and could be a bit in your question, so it's a way to have some other numbers. So, <coughs> then the question here, and the question of the TSH, again, the TSH is usually very high, but there are some reports they have detected even. Try to turn level like that clinical, that clinical hypothyroidism level, TSH elevation, so also they have detected. So it's a very first question, but more of the time, they will have very high TSH with clinical eutyroid fixing. And finally, clinically eutyroid patients can have persistent thyroid hormone kind of picture we discussed with high CT for with high TSH. And if the patient is hypothyroid, hypothyroid clinically, he is so high, it's low TSH, primary hypothyroidism, we have seen all this kind of. And another thing would be normal to high TSH with high CT4, so there could this be TSH trauma or persistent thyroid hormone. Or sometimes if you area treat or other interference or other, this kind of presentation they can come up. Yeah, but the way I have to say, this is the ultimate talk for me, but do not interpret that as a way to have to always go with the symptoms. Why? Particularly, if the person is having significant hyperthyroid day, mostly hyperthyroid can maybe be difficult because they will have great symptoms and other ultimate tests may be helpful for diagnosis. So I would like to thank my mentor, Dr. Benjamin Sikuda, the consultant and the colleagues from the President of the SIT, for providing some of the cases I have discussed with you. So, any questions? Thank you. I think regarding the interest of time, we will proceed. That was a very clear uh, presentation with uh, the norm, how a simple thyroid test can also give another diagnosis. So, I think we should conclude the session in this session. Yeah. Yeah. So, I hand over the certificates uh, of appreciation to our speakers. I would like to thank all who came here to participate. Thank you for the joint virtually. And special thanks go to the, all the uh, president and all the members of the Sri Lanka College of uh, Endocrinologists. And special thanks to my friend. Uh, so, can I ask also uh, uh, this person to be come up on stage to accept their uh, uh, certificate of appreciation? Please come. Dr. Kamani Leonara Thank you.